So welcome everybody on this Thursday evening to our virtual fireside chat um, on real estate after COVID-19 with Addie's CEO and founder, Michael Stevenson. Um, before we get into introducing Mike, uh, just a quick disclaimer that uh, the information provided in this webinar and accompanying materials for informational purposes only and should not be considered financial advice. Um, as always, you should consult with a professional to determine what may be best for your individual needs. If this is your first time joining our webinar, my name is Katie Kernahan. I'm the VP of Marketing here. I host the webinars every week. Um, if you're not familiar with Addy, we are on a mission to make every human a homeowner by enabling real estate investing for as little as a dollar. So thanks for joining us today. Before we get started, we run webinars every Thursday. Here's a quick snapshot of what's coming up next week. Uh, the future of Canadian real estate with Collier's International Vice Chairman Kelly Heed. And then the following week, we're talking real estate and restaurants during a crisis with global restaurant group owner, Imad Yarkoub. For any Addy members on the line or those um, who would like to be entered for a $50 Addy wallet credit, you can create a free account at addyinvest.com. Simply put Mike in the how did you hear about us section and we'll do the draw uh, by tomorrow. And if you would like to share anything um, from the session, you can use addyinvest.com, but let's meet Mike. Um, so Mike is a visionary entrepreneur who's founded several companies prior to Addy, including Payroll Hero, Uber Tour, which was acquired in 2013, and Combustion Hosting, which was acquired in 2006. Um, so to kick things off, Mike, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Um, I'd love to know just what inspired you to found Addy. Yeah, great question. Thanks for asking. Uh, one of my favorite books is a book called Capital in the 21st Century. And in it, uh, the author Thomas Piketty marshaled the data to show that the owners of wealth get steadily richer than ordinary income owners. We at Addy are working to ensure everyone has access to wealth creation. Addy for me is an expression of gratitude of being compelled to make real estate for everyone because real estate currently isn't available for everyone. Let me share an example. Uh, last year, uh, I put together a syndicate to invest in a real estate development in Vancouver. And I didn't have enough funds on my own to go in because I couldn't meet the minimum threshold. Uh, so I put together a group of people and we went in as a group and we invested in this real estate development. Uh, one of my employees found out about it and they asked if they could participate. And the moment they asked me that, I felt bad. And the reason I felt bad is because I knew my reply to them would be the minimum investment amount that I needed for them to participate was $50,000. And when I told them that, uh, I saw it in their eyes. And they were devastated. And I felt like the most horrible person in the world. And I knew we had to change something. So luckily, uh, they were first coming and they challenged me, like, why is that the case? And we at Addy really thought about how can we use technology as a catalyst to make real estate for everyone? How can we use it to um, reduce costs? So my experience is that real estate in this current industry is currently broken. And the other things I think about are the that motivate me are things like the FIRE movement. So FIRE stands for financially independent, retire early. And I also believe that we're living in a world of abundance and with the use of technology, uh, we can create a lot of equality. Um, yeah, I mean, that's something that I obviously really relate to. And it's part of the reason why I'm so excited to be a part of this business is helping um, have nots get access, which um, you know is myself and a lot of my peers. So. Um, really appreciate all the work that we're, we're doing here. And so what is Addy's philosophy on real estate investing? Yeah, uh, well, I'll start with my personal philosophy. I believe that we're all the CEO of our own finances and wealth. And I just wanted to quickly acknowledge everyone for being here tonight and being curious and investing in your learning because no matter what, no one can ever take away your knowledge. Uh, so what makes me proud is that we established Addy around our core uh, brand pillars. The first one being absolute accessibility. And we achieved that by when anyone can invest with as little as $1 into real estate, everyone can become a homeowner. Our second brand pillar is hands-off ownership. And what we do is we enable everyone to participate in real estate where we do all the landlording. You don't have to worry about taking the midnight calls about the black backed up plumbing or the electricity being down. We take care of it through the Addy system. And as being the majority shareholder in each of these investments, we invite the crowd to invest in alongside of us. The third brand pillar that we like is we are expert co-owners. So what we've done is we put together this governance process and we recruited some of the top 
real estate people in the world to help us buy and own properties so the crowd can benefit from their vast knowledge and experiences. And the last thing is what I like about Addy is it's tangible and it's tangible investing. When you invest in Addy, you're actually investing in a specific address that you could walk by, drive by. And I, let me share a story. Uh, it's, a, it's a story that I or reflect on quite often. Um, we were holding a real estate meetup for investing at a uh, port, port side in Gastown. And this lady came up to me and she was very frantic and emotional. I, I kind of stood back and I'm like, okay, what's going on here? I didn't know how to read the situation. And she came up to me and she, she first said, why are you holding this uh, meetup in a non-age inclusive place? And I was taken back and I had to think about it. I'm like, what do you mean by non-age inclusive? And she went on to share, she's a single mom uh, and she has two kids and she lives in Abbotsford. And on the Friday nights, her family activities to watch Love It or List It on Home and Garden TV. And as a family, they never thought they would ever have the opportunity to invest in real estate. When she learned about Addy, she took her children's education savings money and she invested it in their Trout Lake development. But what she said next really made me understand what we are doing at Addy. She went on to share that now on the weekends, her family drives in from Abbotsford to Vancouver and they walk their house. They check out their neighborhood. And they, have a, they feel like they have an ownership stake because they actually do in this house in Vancouver in the Trout Lake community. Yeah, that's really cool. And I think we have a lot of customer stories similar to that with people that feel really connected to the properties just because you can drive by and look at it. Um, so, you know, you mentioned um, expert co-ownership. So how, how does Addy approach and reveal, evaluate sorry, real estate investments? Yeah, uh, so we've fought long and hard. How can we scale this? Uh, all around Canada, around North America, and eventually globally. So we've designed a governance system that is designed with a committee in mind. So internally at Addy, we have real estate analysts that go and suss out deals. And if something looks good, uh, they first share it with our regional experts. And these are parties that are not employed by Addy, but are advisors. And they have deep domain experience in the region in which they are chosen to be a regional expert in. If, if a deal gets past them, it then goes on to our global committee. And if the deal gets past the global committee, it goes to the board. Uh, so what that does is ensures there's all these levels and checks uh, with vast domain experience and sure we're buying the right real estate. The other thing is that we look for good buildings. Uh, so we're looking for buildings with a minimum of 4% cash flow. They have to be solid and they have to be cash flowing today. We're not looking at developments at all. And then we, really discuss on a weekly basis with our advisors. So whether it be in Kelowna with Andrew Gauthier and Tamara Stone or in Vancouver with Mark Strongman. And I'm actually pretty excited to give a bit of a teaser here. Uh, we have two amazing, uh, two people who are joining. So we have a new board member and they have deep real estate experience and they sold one of their real estate companies for over $3.8 billion. And then we have another advisor on technology in the San Francisco area who helped create and build a well-known billion dollar consumer tech company. So stay tuned, we're gonna be releasing uh, their names in the near future. Yeah, really excited to work with both of those people and share it with the group um, in the coming weeks and months. So let's get into what we're really here to talk about which is the impacts of this pandemic. So how is Addy um, as a business handling the impacts of COVID-19? Well, I think first and foremost, uh, we are a technology company. Uh, and we're technologists at heart, uh, and real estate is our product. Uh, so internally, we have always done remote uh, and tech things. So let me share. We do daily huddles every day at 9 08 a.m. with Zoom. Our engineers are actually split between Vancouver, Mexico City, and Tokyo. So they're accustomed to remote work. And what we do is bring everyone together is quarterly. They either come to Vancouver or last time we went to uh, Mexico and the time before that, we were in Hawaii and the time before that, we were in Vietnam. Uh, so we're fully mobile. And we, we also approach life with a sense of venture. Um, and then in our past companies, uh, me and my other co-founder, Stephen Jagger, uh, we built companies that operate in the Philippines, were headquartered in Singapore and also had offices in Whistler and Vancouver. Uh, and just another note that we're hiring and we're growing. So if there's any uh, people who want to join Addy, uh, please email. Awesome. And so you talked a little bit about Addy's approach to real estate investing. Um, how has that changed 
during COVID-19 uh, for, you know, looking at residential versus commercial properties? Yeah, uh, good question. We are definitely in uncharted waters. Uh, so strategically at the board level and internally, we're taking a wait and see uh, while still looking at great properties. With commercial, uh, we definitely pause in and we're waiting to reevaluate as we're not really sure what's gonna happen uh, with retail, food and offices. Uh, so with restaurants restricting the number of customers and with the growth and popularity of food delivery and a new segment called ghost kitchens where commissaries are centrally located, uh, we find that very fascinating. Obviously retail has been under pressure from technology companies for quite a while. Uh, we recently saw that our own homegrown Shopify has recently met the market cap or close to a Royal Bank. Uh, and then with offices, people are figuring out how to work from home. Uh, on the residential side, bottom line, people always need a place to sleep and store their stuff. So we're keen observers in the residential uh, buildings in the lower mainland. Right. And so do you think behavioral changes from this crisis will impact how buyers and renters evaluate property with, you know, some of the social distancing rules, for example? Yeah, for sure. How could they not? I, I think we're going to see consumers paying attention to indoor air quality. Uh, they're going to be looking for buildings that have more open windows. Uh, they want stratas or the owners to perform more regular testing if they're renting. Uh, they're going to be very proactive and they're going to monitor what does the air quality look like? What is filtration? Are there HRVs in the house that are circulating and changing the, the full air of the house once or twice an hour? Um, so, and then also, also for residential, I think balconies are a no brainer uh, going forward because who doesn't want to get outside when you have to stay inside. And I, and I think people are going to start really considering uh, where they live. Is this a place where if I'm expected to live, work and raise a family in here, uh, will it see should work for all those three full time uh, needs? Um, on the other side, I do think it's going to be challenging. There's going to be a lot of change in how open houses uh, so when you're buying a place, I, I could see sellers not wanting random strangers in their home. I already found that kind of a weird activity. Uh, you're in someone's home and you're looking in their, in your closets. Um, and then there's also the advent of things moving more online, like the iBuyer phenomenon. Uh, and then with condo pre-sales, uh, financing challenges uh, for people looking to complete on their pre-sale condos. Mm -hmm. And it might also be interesting to see what happens with like the design of buildings, like more bandwidth to the front door, maybe how spaces are laid out, um, you know, if we're expected to live and work in, in the same space, um, you know, looking at the usage of your space might become more important too. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, given this kind of along that thread, like given the sudden increase in remote work, do you think opportunities for investing are going to shift? Yeah, for sure. Uh, I don't think businesses potentially may not return to their large lease footprints in core business centers. Uh, definitely with small businesses, some of them may not recover. Uh, and what's gonna happen when they can't pay their rents and the landlords, the follow in fact, the landlords not paying their rents, I mean their mortgages to the banks. Uh, so it's really gonna have us rethink. And I think what will emerge is what, what is in the future will be the highest and best use of that property. Uh, with industrial real estate, a warehousing, light manufacturing and logistics space has proven to be itself invaluable during this time. I was reading about, I think it's Equinox REIT and uh, they're the ones who supply AWS with all their data centers, how that has been on a growth trend. Um, but I think if you just think about a typical company and you could assume, let's say 20% of employees uh, who have been working at home decide to stay remote, what would the space requirements look like in the future and I sometimes wonder if 20% decide to stay home, but there is an increased need for a distance between desks. Do those, is it net neutral? So do those office spaces stay the same or do they potentially grow in space requirements simply because they have to have more space between desks and between employees in the company? Um, and then I also wonder like, uh, will more companies hot desk? So will employees choose and want to work from home two or three days a week and only go on to the office on those days and uh, different teammates will still utilize five days a week, but it'd be different teams going in and out. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how the fundamental shift happens coming out of, you know, 
create essentially creating habits over the past like couple of months um how that you know yeah it just effectively changes the way things up the way things um work so what other impacts are you considering well i think for money it's going to have a lot harder time moving in and out as real estate going forward um there's obviously people buy with how much money they feel they have and with the economic damage done from the oil price wars it's definitely affecting the economy and how rich people feel uh so is that going to affect second homes um unemployment rates are obviously increasing and i wonder how long it's going to take to recover those jobs um and then it comes down to who wants to buy a house uh when cities are in lockdown, how can you even see the home? And do you really want to move and deal with that additional stress of what really is one of life's most stressful situations? Uh, we, we definitely do know currently that banks are being risk averse to lending. Uh, they're insisting on lower uh, loans. So they're looking at a lower uh, loan to value ratio and they're only lending to those with the best credit score. So higher credit scores are needed. Um, and then I'm not sure yet, but you can think about the baby boomers and the retired cement savings and their need for, for ongoing cash flow. How's that being affected this coming year uh, with dividends being stopped or reduced? Mm -hmm. So do you think we'll see negative interest rates? <laughs> great, great question. I think potentially anything is possible. Um, I do personally feel it's currently too early to tell. But I, I want to point you to an article I was reading. Uh, so it's a report from the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco published last month. And what they did is they looked into the past 15 great pandemics since the 15th century. And in the article, it concludes that when we go through years in which private savings trend up and investments trend down, that leads to a semi-permanent decline in the natural rate of interest, which on average is about 150 basis point decline. So if you think about the Canadian bond mortgage rate today, I just got an update, is around 86 basis points, and Canada prime is 2.45%. What does 150 basis point decline in those interest rates look like? Interesting. So, I mean, given all of this, do you think Addy will change its approach to real estate investing coming out of this crisis? Yes, uh, we already have. So we are nimble. And with the spotlight cast on the inequality uh, through either the payroll protection plan that you're seeing in the United States or locally with small businesses not being able to access the loans, uh, we're definitely as a team more driven than ever to make every human a homeowner. Uh, and I also see this for the first time being very intrigued in things and concepts like ghost kitchens. And can you just expand a little bit on what ghost kitchen is? So a ghost kitchen is a centralized, uh, it could be a warehouse. And what happens is a company like DoorDash or Deliveroo will set up 50 kitchens in this one space of very of different restaurants. So instead of like DoorDash going to Earl's and Cactus Club and Joey's, they come to this one address where there is a Joey's, a Cactus Club and Earl's kitchen inside, and they pick up their deliveries from the central place. And these locations are generally central. So it, enables quick logistics and fulfillment of home delivery. Right. <clears throat> so, um, I mean, as, as a business, Addy was looking at getting another property on the platform pretty quickly uh, prior to this crisis. Um, and then obviously, uh, you know, we haven't ruled that out yet. So what's the update on the property that we were looking at? Uh, okay. Uh, well, we're still interested in the Vancouver Island, Kelowna and the Lower Mainland. Um, we're currently taking a wait and see what happens with the market. Uh, definitely our commitment is to make the best possible investment decision for our members. Uh, and also uh, everyone I think needs to remember, we are the largest owner of any property we add to the system. So we have skin in the game, the most skin in the game and our interests are financially aligned. Uh, as to the property, uh, if things didn't happen, it would be live today. It currently isn't. We still have the property under contract. Uh, we've extended our subject removal. Uh, we've extended our term sheet from the financial institution. So we still have the mortgage in place. Uh, and we're just reevaluating it and see what happens in the near future. Um, if anyone in the crowd is interested in learning about what properties we're interested in and what potentially is going to be available for them to buy, all they have to do is become a verified by Addy member 
and they can log in and in their portfolio view, they can see all potential properties that we've evaluated. And more than that, uh, they can give their comments. So they could tell us, do they like or dislike this property? If they dislike it, why? If they like it, why? And how much they're willing to invest. And that helps guide us as to what our next property will be. Yeah, exactly. And on the marketing side, super helpful for us to make sure that we're picking the right stuff for everybody. So does this crisis change types of markets that Addy's looking at, like primary markets versus secondary markets? Yeah. Uh, so maybe let me answer that first personally. I've had the fortune of living in Vancouver, living in Whistler, San Francisco, Manila, and Singapore. Uh, so having spent 10 years in a secondary market like Whistler, uh, I got to realize cities are a thing for me. And I think innately we're all either we're all intrinsically motivated by the tribe we choose to surround ourselves with. So I think there is, there's a, there's a degree of people that want to live in cities and the degree of people who want to live in secondary uh, cities. But what I do know is that cities have proven to be great survivors since the beginning of the recorded history. Cities have experienced plagues, pandemics, fires, earthquakes, and they are still destinations for pools of abundant thinkers. Uh, but I also very much know that secondary markets have their place as well. Uh, so whether it's a person seeking out uh, that specific lifestyle or even going through a uh, stage of life change and moving from a primary city to a secondary market to avoid the hustle and bustle. Uh, so we're, we do look at both. And so uh, what do you think about the short-term rental market? Do you think it will recover? Ah, good question. I, uh, well, I think we all know that tourism has been clobbered by COVID-19. Um, and not only do tourists help fuel short-term rentals like Airbnb and filler hotels, but many long-term renters uh, work in tourism and hospitality, and they are definitely uh, temporarily laid off or furloughed today. Um, what we are see, seeing in the market is there is a lot of Airbnb rentals uh, on Craigslist, uh, and those are being added to the long-term uh, market pool. So that's encouraging, and that should help get more people living in the communities where they work or choose to want to live. Um, in terms of short-term rental market, I think going forward, more people are going to assist on sanitation and spaces and more cleanliness. And I was reading an article the other day where Hilton made an interesting move and they co-branded with Lysol and the Mayo Clinic. So when you stay at Hilton, you know now that they are using Lysol products and they're consulting with the Mayo Clinic on cleanliness and hygiene. That's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see the moves that you know the creativity that comes from this to try and maintain the customer base so let's look ahead a little bit to after COVID-19 um, do you think that there's going to be a cooling off period for the market and for Vancouver yeah um, I think v Vancouver is going to be seen by the globe as a great place I think our leadership in Vancouver and in British Columbia have done phenomenally well. Uh, we were first to act and really uh, planking and plateauing our curve. And I think like, if you're a person and you live in Singapore or you live in New York uh, and you don't, and you do feel there's going to be another pandemic at some point, Vancouver is looking like a great place. Um, so I think demand ebbs and flows, but there will be a cooling off period for sure, but I think it's going to come back uh, viciously like a tiger. Mm -hmm. um, I think we're going to have to wait and see a little more time to pass to understand what kind of effects it's going to have on the condominium market. As we previously talked about, there is a lot of uh, purposely purchased uh, Airbnb rentals and be interested to see what happens uh, to those units. Um, but in the end of the day, uh, for residential real estate, people still need that place to sleep and to store their stuff. Uh, one thing that we look at at Addy is buying great assets from distressed owners, not distressed assets. Uh, so I think Addy is very unique in that we're a cash buyer. Uh, and then we allow everyone to invest in the real estate. So an example of that may be if three siblings inherited a building uh, and one of them needs to diversify and want their money out. Addy would be a great partner to come in. The two 
siblings who want to stay into the property can choose to for the Addy uh, program. And then the crowd could go and purchase that remaining one third. Right. So um, foreign buyers may be out of the picture for a while. And this combined with the speculation tax and other measures that were already in place um, may have an impact on this. What do you, what do you think about that? Yeah. Uh, well, I think notionally Canada lives in a ban of good. Uh, so our worst public school is good and our best private school is good. Our worst healthcare is good and our best healthcare is good. And, and I think this band of good is what makes us Canadian where you might find in other countries where their worst public school and their best private school are really bad and really amazing. Uh, so I think this, the fact that Canada lives within the band of good is very appealing to foreign buyers. Uh, I think Canada's strength is in its immigration uh, and I think personally, just because I won the birthplace lottery and I was happened to be born in Vancouver, uh, doesn't mean that I don't want Vancouver to have more people from around the world who choose to make this their home. Cause I think that is our strength. Mm -hmm. So what do you think, um, like if we're talking supply and demand, what do you think is going to happen as a result of COVID-19? Yeah, I think some asset classes might weather this pandemic better than others, but I think the longer it drags on, uh, the tougher the recovery is going to be. Uh, so temporary layoff date is coming up. So in BC, uh, you could temporarily lay off an employee for 13 weeks. Uh, so I think beginning probably the first couple of weeks in July, uh, employers are going to have to make that tough decision. Uh, if they want to do a permanent layoff or furlough their employees, or if they want to hire them back because they can't leave them on temporary layoffs anymore. Um, and I think also in regards to term and supply, I think we had this initial rate on stores to fill up everyone's pantries. Uh, consumer spending was down 7% last quarter, uh, but savings and rates have hit the highest level since 1981. So I think a lot of that capital, uh, it's gonna be seeking investment opportunities. And I think everyone's gonna be asking themselves, do I wanna enter equities or do I wanna put money in something that's less volatile and long-term stable like real estate? Right. So I've heard a lot of people say that they're holding off like the COVID discount on real estate. Uh, do you think there'll be opportunities for buyers coming out of this crisis? Yeah, I think commercial valuations for sure. Uh, so commercial properties trade on cap rates and cap rates are really based upon uh, income. So if tenants are default in the rental payments and the properties are left vacant, uh, definitely those cap rates will come down and those property total purchase price are going to come down. When you see companies like uh, Cheesecake Factory, for example, go on a rent strike, and I think Gap recently said they're not paying the rent, uh, it's going to leave a lot of these landlords in precarious positions. Uh, but on the, on the flip side, I also think about malls. Uh, just last year, I was thinking a lot of like strip malls and rural malls were dead, but I was wrong because I've been seeing innovations like Rio Can turn in their malls into residential communities with the malls and anchor. And I've been seeing other innovations where some of these malls are being turned into e-sport arenas. Um, in terms of condo completions, I, we, can, we can reflect on what happened in 2008, 2009. Uh, and at that period during the last financial crisis, there was a number of towers completed where the pre-purchasers simply didn't show up on closing day. Uh, they gave up the deposits and they walked away. I don't think that's going to happen uh, post COVID-19 simply because uh, there is a lot more protection in the market. Uh, I don't know if, if everyone remembers, but uh, the office, uh, so OFSI uh, increased uh, the minimum uh, criteria to be eligible for a mortgage. So there's a lot more protections in the system today. Um, what may be interesting is what happens uh, once all these mortgage deferrals come due. So. Currently, a lot of people have been able to defer their mortgage payments for six months. Um, so we won't see the extent of distress assets in the market to that comes up. Um, so I think give it time. I think the, our first milestone that we're going to have to wait and evaluate for is the July when temporary layoff uh, maximums come due. And then the next one would be those six months mortgage deferrals. Right. So I think that um, segues nicely into my next question, which is what opportunities do you see for Addy in the coming 12 months? 
Yeah, uh, so Addy has extremely powerful software that enables us to be smart buyers. Uh, I like to think that we're pretty experienced technologists and we're leveraging technology as a catalyst to transform real estate. Uh, so what that enables us to do is for our next property, we're striving to hit 10,000 owners into the property. Uh, so that what that might look like if we buy, let's say a building in Kitsilano, uh, we can enable the people of Kitsilano, then the people of Vancouver, then the people of BC to for that first opportunity to invest a hundred dollars into that property. That'd be pretty cool. Um, so I'm going to just pivot a little bit. You just inspired me with another question. So what do you think will happen with vacancy rates? I want to test what that for residential and commercial. Yeah. Uh, so I think residential rates are going to, they're going to stay uh, pretty stable. And if not, they're going to grow. I think a lot of people are choosing to rent uh, going forward instead of buy. And like I said, I think a few times now, at the end of the day, people need a place to sleep and to store their stuff. I think commercial, uh, it's still way too early to tell. We're definitely in uncharted waters. Um, and we already had uh, a few attacks on retail and on restaurants through technologies, whether that be food delivery services or things like Shopify or Amazon. Um, yeah. And so in your opinion, how can someone prepare for upcoming real estate investment opportunities? Okay, so a shameless self plug here is fund your Addy wallet. Uh, if you have your funds in your Addy wallet, you are in a ready position to invest. Uh, obviously, do your due diligence. I think attending this webinar or past webinars or future webinars is a great way to stay educated about real estate. Um, read uh, our chairman's book called The Price of Tomorrow. In it, he describes uh, the impacts of monetary easing on assets. So basically the more money, uh, and there's also a good video today from Goldman Sachs, the more money they pour into the market, the more it's gonna drive up these asset prices, that being in our case, real estate. Um, I'm pretty happy that we enable everyone to own real estate with as little as a dollar. Uh, and then I think the biggest one is there's no better way to learn about real estate than to make it real. Uh, for the tuition cost of $1, I think Addy gives everyone the opportunity to sit beside us participate, learn, and share in the actual profits from experienced investors. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Tim Ferriss once said that he had a choice if he was going to spend $250,000 getting his MBA, or was he simply going to invest $50,000 in five startups? He decided the five startups, and obviously he got way more real learning from that. <laughs> right. So I've heard you talk a lot about B Corp and triple bottom line. Can you expand a little bit um, on that? Yeah. So we're really inspired and definitely moving towards being a B Corp. Uh, our CFO, Adrian, was instrumental in helping our prior company, Spud, uh, become a B Corp. Uh, so B Corps are businesses that meet the highest level and they're verified and audited on an annual basis of a triple bottom line. And the triple bottom line being societal, economical, and environmental. So how that actually, uh, how that actually comes to, to life in Addy would look like this. So imagine single parents, frontline workers, school teachers. Uh, and then remember our mission is making every human a homeowner. So for example, you could come to the Addy site and you will see two houses in the same neighborhood. One will be rented and you, you can invest in it and you'll get an 8% return. And the other home will be rented to only school teachers who work in that neighborhood school and want to live close to work, walk to work, and they want to live in the community where their kids happen to be because that's the catchment, but you only get a 4% return. I think if with our goal of having 10,000 investors into any one property and everyone us seeking a maximum of $100 investment from any one investor into any one property, a person at a $100 level would choose to make the choice to get a 4% economical return over the 8% economical return because the societal return is so huge from enabling a teacher who lives close to the school to be happy and to walk to school and to be around her students. Right, um, I think that's just so cool. So there's been a lot of news around millennials piling money into the stock market and other investing opportunities. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, I think stock markets are great. Uh, 
but I think there, there's the flip side to invest in, in equities and there's a lot of cognitive um, costs. So understanding the alpha, the beta, understanding cash flow, what price to earnings is, are, are, I think are what makes uh, you an investor in the stock market versus a person who places bets. Uh, for us, real estate, I think everyone is able to invest in real estate at a gut level. I think most people understand what a good location is and what a good building is. And they also understand what levers can be pulled on to make that location even better. So in Vancouver, uh, there may be a neighborhood that has a park near it and that's great. But if all of a sudden there's SkyTrain coming up, coming to that neighborhood, I think we could all notionally know that the value of that real estate is going to increase. And to me, that's a really easy investment uh, where a stock could go to zero. It's highly unlikely uh, your real estate investment would go to zero simply because uh, in most great cities around the world, let's call it notionally 80% of the value of the real estate you're investing in is in the land. 20% or less is in the building. So at worst, uh, you forget to insure your building, it burns down, you still got 80% of the value of your investment in the land safe. Right. So what role do you think technology will play in the future of real estate investing? Yeah, I think a lot. I think what we're seeing definitely with Gen Z and millennials, uh, they understand today that the barriers to entry for real estate are too high, even just for the down payment. Uh, they don't want the burdens of home ownership maintenance. And to be frank, they have the busiest lives of any generation uh, we have ever seen. Um, and they want to travel. And who doesn't like travel? Uh, I think this is a generation that has brought about the popularity of crowdfunding. You have things like uh, Kickstarter, GoFundMe, and we're really seeing the power of people speaking their internal political views through their dollars. Uh, so I think technology is starting to disrupt a very uh, established system of the housing market. Uh, and we've seen lots of change uh, in a very short period of time. So I think that's coming to real estate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think millennials just innately are, and Gen Z are just asking like, why are things done this way? How can it be done differently? It doesn't make any sense. So what resources do you spend time on to stay up to date? Yeah, uh, so I enjoy listening to the Vancouver Real Estate Podcast. Uh, definitely the Pump Podcast. Uh, he's very entertaining. Uh, reading Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Bloomberg on Apple News. Uh, and I read a lot about human psychology and my favorite book of that regard is not so much a psychology book, more of an evol evolutionary book. It's called Sapiens. And it's about us as a species, being the cognitive species, because I know we have big brains and sometimes they get in the way of us doing great things. Right. And so I'm just gonna ask a couple more questions before we turn it over to Q&A from everybody else. But are you a buyer right now? Yeah, I think I'm always a buyer. Uh, I'm very passionate about real estate. Uh, I'm always looking on realtor.ca or checking out Craigslist for sale by a homeowner. Uh, so I'm a buyer in up and down markets. And I personally believe there's always a good deal to be had if you do the hard work and you do your due diligence. And then last question, what's your number one piece of advice to real estate investors right now? I think financial modeling. Um, model your financials on every property you're looking at. Once you got your spreadsheet template, it's really easy to plug in those variables. Uh, and I think I would add to that, now is a great time. If you're not already doing it, do sensitivity analysis. I think from COVID-19, uh, you have a new range of inputs for your sensitivity analysis of any of your financial models for real estate. Awesome. Those are really good piece of advice. So I think with that, we're going to flip it over to questions. Uh, Steve Jagger, uh, co-founder of Addy, will facilitate questions. I believe we've had quite a few come through. So I'll flip it over to Steve. Hey, everybody. Thank you um, very much. So yeah, there's a lot, a lot of questions coming in. Um, they're all over the, they're all over the map. I've been moving them around a bit, Mike. So, um, but I'll start with the, the most recent, cause you just said um, modeling was important and sensitivity analysis. And the question that came in was, what, what, what is, what is sensitivity analysis? Yeah, I think uh, sensitivity analysis for modeling is just uh, you think of your worst case scenario and best case scenario. So I think some people, uh, your, your first base of model is 
if you had a hundred percent rental, you were full hundred percent of the time. So now a sensitivity analysis, like what if I take the standard of 5% vacancy rate, and then you could take it to an even greater extreme and say, what happens if there's another COVID-19? Uh, what happens to my vacancy rate? Or what if there's a rent strike? Cool. Got it. Thank you. Um, here's one that uh, I think we get a lot is how does $1 work out for anybody, the investor or Addy? Yeah. And I think this goes back to uh, one of my starting statements is Addy is a technology company. Um, we use technology to enable everyone to invest in real estate. Obviously, uh, a lot of the traditional family offices or syndicates or real estate groups, uh, they'll use a legal firm uh, to do the contracts, sign them, maintain their corporate uh, securities register. We've automated all that with Addy. So in less than eight minutes, anyone can open their phone, do their KYC, know your client, do their AML, their anti-money laundering, sign their shareholders agreement, vote and trust agreement, uh, their share subscription agreement, all online, all on their phone, and then instantly be able to log in into their portfolio. And on the back end, where a lot of companies are using Excel spreadsheets to maintain a lot of these uh, compliance and governance uh, rules and tasks, we've automated it all. So we could spit out a report of exempt distribution with a click of the button. Perfect. Um... We've got a couple of realtors on the line. Um, one of the questions came in was, how does Addy work with real estate brokers? Uh, good question. I think, uh, so we currently in the commercial side are working with a few real estate brokers. Uh, and then in the Okanagan Valley, we're working with a few residential real estate brokers. Uh, so no different than any other investor. Uh, we work with real estate brokers uh, and what we found uh, for doing our meetups with different real estate brokers is they're very into Addy because what they, they're usually on the sidelines. So they help close all these deals and they see all these amazing buying opportunities, but they don't get to participate. I think the power of Addy and working with Addy as a real estate professional is that if you help us close a deal, you could participate on Perry Pursue terms for your pro rata investment. So that even means as low as a dollar. So if we make 10% on the buy, on the initial buy, you can make 10% on your initial buy as well. Yeah. And I'll, I'll, I would add technically all of their other real estate broker buddies can also participate. They didn't have to do the deal to get involved, which is, yeah. uh, which is great. Um, so here's a, again, different topic, but um, is having a downtown office still economically beneficial if work from home becomes more common? Or do technologies such as autonomous vehicles create less need for efficient transit uh, transit systems? Yeah, I think it's it really depends. So I don't want to speak in wide brushstrokes, but I like to use the number 20%. So I'm a big fan of Pareto. Uh, so I personally feel that perhaps 20% of employees are going to choose to work from home. Uh, but I think we are as a species, uh, and I'll go back to that book, Sapiens, uh, I think by Jared Diamond, uh, we like to organize in groups. So I think people are still gonna wanna congregate, be together. It's very important, especially in the knowledge-based industry, so technology. I know as, as us as a company, we love doing ideations and it's really hard to do it via Zoom. We wanna be in person. Yep. Um, okay, again, different topic. How long does Addy hold on to a property before it decides to flip? Great question. I, I wouldn't necessarily suggest we flip, but yeah, <laughs> that's the question. Yeah, so I think minimum uh, a horizon for an investment is five years, sometimes it's 10. And it really comes down to what is the hypothesis for that property? Uh, generally, what we're seeking are income producing properties. So it could be an apartment built in and it's a five cap, right? So you'll earn 5%. It's kind of like a bond or annuity. Uh, and you get the fun of potentially being a renter in that building and also owning part of the building. So minimum five, maybe as long as 10 before uh, we sunset uh, the investment uh, and we sell it and there's a total cash uh, redemption for its shareholders. Cool. What, um, 
would you consider COVID to be a, a leveling of the playing field temporarily for, lo for local buyers as foreign buyers might be locked out for the next six to 12 months? And it's in brackets, ideally no bidding wars. Bidding wars? Yeah, I, potentially. I think it really depends on the property type. But I, I think we've seen firsthand uh, the decrease in asset value or property value in West Vancouver, uh, which previously was a hot zone for foreign buyers. Uh, I don't know. I think, I think a hot property in a great neighborhood is always going to have a bid and war. Uh, if I was the only person bidding on a property, I'd be asking myself, why? Why? Right? Yeah, it is concerning if you're the only one. Um, so switching over to the, the sort of the Addy buying side, uh, I got two questions from actually two different people. One was, um, how do you find a distressed owner? Uh, I think as Addy, we're in a bit of a unique situation uh, where property owners are coming to us. Uh, so... Um, we're grateful uh, that we we're being exposed to these opportunities uh, where an owner wants to divest of either their entire ownership or a portion of it. And they want to sell it to the crowd. They don't want to see it go to a unknown buyer. They want to see it be bought by the community and understand uh, the little old lady down the street or the barista at their favorite coffee shop is, has an opportunity to buy into their commercial building. Uh, I think distressed owners, um, they'll make themselves known, right? Uh, you'll see it in uh, someone, yeah, you'll just see them, whether it be in Craigslist or through owners, uh, I mean, through real estate professionals. Yeah, and this one, I think, kind of is part of that, uh, but also it was asked by a different person, but it's uh, it said the sibling example, how does one sibling stay in? Can Addy buy part of a property? Yeah, uh, so it kind of depends, uh, and we haven't done it yet, but we got a great legal team at Baskin uh, who has a couple different strategies dependent upon the sellers. But notionally, let's say there's an apartment building for a million dollars, Addy will buy the entire building for a million dollars, and then the owners who want to stay into the property will have exclusive first rights to buy that amount of shares. So if they want to stay in for 25%, they automatically will have a contract that awards them the ability to buy up to 250,000 shares at $1 each. Great. And then, so switching back to a realtor question, I, mean, I think it's a realtor, but it says, uh, which technology will disrupt the real estate industry most? I, I, actually, I don't know. I, I read it as if it was a realtor asking about real estate industry from a realtor's point of view, but maybe... I don't know, hit it on both sides. I, I, I just think of our own family and I know that our propensity to online shop is higher than ever and more convenient. I'll give an example. Uh, uh, being at home a lot, we decided to do some minor home renovations and we needed a bunch of stuff from Home Depot. Knowing that Home Depot is closed, I went online to homedepot.ca, ordered what I want, got an email when it was ready, drove to the Home Depot, parked in a parking stall with a number, called the number, opened up my trunk, and they put the stuff in my trunk and I drove away. I thought that was a really convenient process. Uh, and I think if you apply that analogy of ghost kitchens to ghost uh, grocery stores or ghost uh, home depots, what does that look like in terms of uh, retail? And I think we've already seen it. Uh, Robson Street used to be the greatest, hottest street and the lower mainland in Vancouver for sure. Uh, and it hasn't been for a long time. I think people much prefer uh, walking the shops of Main Street or walking the shops of Fourth. Awesome, so I've got um, uh, two more. I thought I had one more, but I've got two more here. Um, you said earlier, companies will rethink their footprint. This person says, what do you mean when companies will rethink their footprint in a commercial building? Yeah, uh, well, I know as a CEO of a startup, I definitely think uh, when we hire a professional, be it legal or accounting, if, if they're in one of those pricey buildings downtown, I know a great deal of our service fees is going for that rent. Uh, but what's been more interesting is 
a lot of these services, uh, professional firms are reevaluating the need. Do they need five floors at a dental building? And do they need to be paying millions of dollars a year in rent? Uh, where that money, especially uh, recently, there's a lot of reports of law firms taking serious reductions in pay amongst the partners and furloughing a lot of their paralegals. Uh, if they're giving up 30%, uh, do they feel the office space is that important going forward? Yeah, true. I think a lot of them are going to rethink it. Um, so last question here um, before I bring Katie back in, but uh, what do you think happens to restaurants? Can they generally pay their rents if they have to rethink their whole seating plan? Yeah, uh, I think so. I think they, I think restaurants for a long time have needed to differentiate themselves with an experience. Uh, one of my favorite restaurants is, is a place called Dachi, uh, and it's over on Hastings. Uh, and the reason why I like it, uh, when you go there, you feel like you're at home and it's an experience. Uh, I could order food on DoorDash, have ramen delivered to my home. Uh, we could cook a great meal at home, but I think there's something about going out to a restaurant, uh, being greeted, welcomed, feeling like you're home, but not having to cook or do the dishes, getting drinks that are too labor intensive to make. Uh, I, I'm a big fan of cocktails and a lot of effort goes into uh, the cocktails I like to drink. So I'm really appreciative uh, of restaurants and I will always find value in that experience. Because for me, it's not about food or the drinks, it's about the experience. Um, totally, I agree. And I'm, I miss restaurants so much right now. <laughs> um, but that also segues nicely into our webinar for anyone who wants to know about restaurants. Um, on May 14th, we're speaking with Global Restaurant Group owner, Emad Yacoub. So if you have any restaurant specific questions and want to dive deeper on that, definitely join us in two weeks. Um, so with that, I think we'll wrap it up um, just a little bit before seven, let everyone go head back to their dinners with their families, whatever you're doing this evening. Um, but as a reminder, we drink this every Thursday. So we'd love to have you join and we're streaming on Facebook live as well. So um, stay tuned for the next few and we'll send a recording of this webinar out to everybody in case you'd like to watch it again. But thanks a lot, Mike. Appreciate it. That was great. Katie, thanks, Steve. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>